predicting the next tsunami and preventing another tragic loss of life partly depends on understanding how tsunamis are created. Walter Dudley, a professor of oceanography, studies how movement of the seabed can generate tsunamis. It can be uh, faulting, which produces a large earthquake, or a big chunk of seafloor is pushed up, or drops down, or even moves sideways. As long as it pushes a lot of water, it can generate tsunami waves. A vertical movement of the Earth's crust on the seafloor jolts a column of water upwards and pumps vast energy into the ocean. Which is what happened in the Indian Ocean quake. The giant earthquake shook people awake, as far apart as Thailand and the Maldives. It lasted for eight minutes. It shook so violently that many people were unable to stand. The Indonesian tsunami was so severe because a section of almost 800 miles along the seabed suddenly flexed upwards. This vertical jolt miles from land forced the sea upwards by about 10 feet producing the tsunami that reared up to become a 90-foot wall of water as it reached the coast. The force of the earthquake was roughly equivalent to a 100 gigaton bomb. That's six million times the power of the atom bomb that fell on Hiroshima at the end of World War II. These satellite pictures show Banda Aceh, the home of 225,000 people in northern Sumatra, before and after the tsunami. Costas Sinalakis from the University of Southern California studied the Indonesian tsunami's terrifying destructive power. This mountain of water that results from the motion of the seabed, the motion up, starts moving towards Sumatra. And when it hits the coast, it's a mountain of water 15 feet high and tens of miles long, moving inland and destroying like a bulldozer everything in its path. The sheer volume of water on the move makes a tsunami dangerous. But two other factors make it even more deadly. The first is its speed. Tsunami waves in the deep ocean travel at incredible speeds, the speed of a, of a jet airliner. But even when they come ashore, it would probably be going more than 30 miles an hour. That's much faster than anyone can run. Tsunamis travel so fast and so far because their energy is transmitted rapidly and efficiently through the water. What we're really talking about is the speed of propagation of the energy pulse because the actual water particles don't move. They, it's the energy pulse as it goes through the water medium that moves. The principle can be demonstrated with a Newton's cradle, a popular executive desktop toy. The energy of the first swinging ball travels from globe to globe with hardly any movement at all of the central balls as the energy pulse passes through them. It's similar to the way tsunami energy moves. The water particles move a little bit forward and then they move backward and end up right where they started. There's a second factor that makes a tsunami so lethal. It remains a silent and almost invisible threat till the very last moment. While at sea, the waves may be only a few feet high. They can even pass under a ship unnoticed. Only in shallow water does the height climb dramatically as the pulse or shock wave converts into a wall of water. The length of the tsunami pulses as they come ashore 
can be more than a hundred miles long. They flow onto the shore like a relentless river, sometimes for over an hour, unlike a conventional wave, which breaks, then withdraws after a few seconds. The way to understand how tsunamis can be relatively benign in the deep ocean but so destructive on shore is because of the wave length. That is the key component to their destructive nature. The front end of the wave is slowing and hitting the shoreline, while the rest of the wave, which may be 100 miles offshore, is still rushing in and piling up on the back. It's like a gigantic train wreck. The front end of the train hits the wall first, and then the back end of the train continues piling in and destroying everything in its path. The impact can be truly devastating. Unstoppable walls of water that drive on and on and on. 